Here's what we know about our megabases in Iraq, and I pick them because they're typical of what websites like TomDispatch.com have had to offer these last years. That, that you simply can't find in the mainstream media. We, we know this is a start, and we know this from the New York Times, from two good reporters. At about the time that U.S. troops took Baghdad, um, the New York Times on their front page had a story saying that the Pentagon already had four major permanent bases underway on the planning boards in Iraq. Um, when Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was asked about this, uh, he denied that they were permanent bases. He used a term that the military liked to use then, which is rather charming. He called them enduring camps. The, the story of permanent bases in Iraq then basically disappeared, largely disappeared, from the press for some years, during which multi-billions of American dollars, taxpayer dollars, went into building these enormous mega bases. They're American towns. We've had a few reporters who have actually gone, good reporters who have gone and visited them, uh, by about 2005, we already had 105 American bases, large and small, in Iraq. Uh, Tom Ricks of the Washington Post went and visited Balad, which is about 60, 80 clicks north of uh, Baghdad. It's a huge air base. It has the kind of traffic that Chicago's O'Hare Airport or London's Heathrow does. Um, it has 30 to 40,000 uh, soldiers, contractors, Defense Department uh, officials. Uh, it's a 16-mile square fortified um, American town, basically. Uh, multiple bus routes. It has uh, PXs. It has uh, subways and pizza huts and so on and so forth. It's quite something. Uh, Guy Raz, uh, NPR's um, corresp uh, defense correspondent, visited it in 2007 and said that it looked like Las Vegas. This is in a country that can't deliver electricity a lot of the time. It was lit up like Las Vegas, and he called it a huge construction site. Uh, Oliver Poole, a British reporter, went to Al-Assad, which is a big marine air base in the uh, western desert of Iraq. Um, it's called uh, Camp Cupcake by the troops because of the amenities that it has. Um, uh, it even has traffic lights. You can get speeding tickets. This is in a country where basically, if there are traffic lights, they largely don't work. Um, now, let me just ask a question. It's a question that I've been thinking about recently. Um, We've all watched TV all these years. Have you ever seen on TV a story about these bases where you got to see these huge things that we're building that are really the facts on the ground in Iraq that should be the essence of any discussion of what we're doing there? Um, you know, a, a reporter like Math Martha Raddatz, uh, an ABC reporter I admire greatly, but she's reported from Camp Victory, one of these, uh, probably the fifth of these huge bases on the edge of Baghdad. Um, she reports relatively regularly from there, uh, but you never see the camera pan beyond her. She's reporting on the situation in Iraq or whatever. Um, a bunch of reporters landed with the president last year when he was meeting Prime Minister Maliki at al-Assad, that base in western um, Iraq. Did they stay the next day and show you what the base looked like? No. You know, you can, you can find a few pieces in print. Basically, the American people have not been able to see what the things that are being built in their name even look like. And they're remarkable. I mean, they're just, they're just so staggeringly large and staggeringly expensive. And to this day, they're being upgraded to the tune of billions of dollars. I mean, if you take another, what in essence is another base in Iraq, the American embassy, the huge imperial embassy being built for a thousand so-called diplomats uh, on a Vatican-sized or nearly Vatican-sized plot of land in the middle of Baghdad, uh, in the middle of the, the fortified green zone of Baghdad, um, when the architect for that embassy put up images, um, a very crude drawings of what the PX would look like and uh, the pool, and the, this is quite an elaborate thing with its own anti-missile zone, its own electric systems, and so on and so forth. Um, when when he put that, uh, uh, when the architect, architectural firm put those pictures up, and Tom Dispatch found them and publicized them, the State Department declared it a security breach, and they pulled the site, the whole architect's website, uh, down. Um, so I think you can assume, on the whole, that the Pentagon, the Bush administration, has not wanted us to see what they're building any more than they wanted us to, to see these expanding prisons they're building in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and the odd thing is, polls show that when Americans are asked 
about these permanent bases that they can't see and know almost nothing about, do they want them? The rare polls that have asked, and the very large majority of Americans do not want permanent bases in Iraq. Nonetheless, they're there. This is the sort of subject that um, TomDispatch.com um, has been covering for years that you basically don't find in the mainstream. Um, and um, we have a new book out, The World According to Tom Dispatch, uh, which covers, I mean, this isn't the only subject. It covers a whole series of these uh, subjects that we've, we've touched over the years. The air war in Iraq. I mean, the odd thing is, Air war is the American way of war, and it's been accelerating in Iraq, and yet, on the whole, American reporters, strangely enough, don't look up. So um, uh, we really don't know. You've heard endless amounts about the ground surge, the president's 30,000-man surge into Baghdad uh, in 2007, uh, which is now over, but very little about the ongoing air surge. The sur that's the surge that's continuing. Um, these are the sort of subjects that Dar Jamail, Chalmers Johnson, Rebecca Solnit, Nick Terse, Michael Clare, and a number of other people uh, cover at Tom Dispatch regularly. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I was thinking about as I put together this book, um, was what the value is sometimes of a guy alone in a room. Because really, in a way, that's what I've been for the last six or seven years while I've been doing Tom Dispatch. I'm Tom Englehart, by the way, in case nobody said. Um, and sometimes it helps not to be the guy on the scene, not the guy having uh, interviewing the general, having dinner with the senator, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you can see the world more clearly when you're really in a room by yourself and all the other influences don't get in the way. Sometimes when you're in a room by yourself, you can look up or you can notice those permanent bases. And I think that's really been the advantage in some ways, of the political internet is, in a way, you could think of it as a lot of uh, 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 a lot of people in rooms who are looking at the world without some of the filters that seem to stop so many people in the mainstream from reporting on what often seems like the obvious thing. And uh, sometimes I think there's it's no wonder that young readers are being sucked out of uh, out of the print press and. Uh, onto the political internet in hordes because, uh, because there you can often find the stories that should be written but aren't.